I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital History Series, the first group of presentations. Um, I'm Ian Goff, a retired surgeon, uh, and uh, I have the privilege to be the chair of the uh, Alumni Association. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Many of our current staff members haven't come very far just across the campus, but I know that some of our guests tonight have made uh, a special trip to join us. I'd like to thank our guest speakers uh, this evening, Jim Myers, Jeanette Wiley, Robin Cook, Charles George, and as you'll discover in a moment, uh, Cliff Pollard, who've taken the time out of their busy schedules to prepare and present this evening. And we uh, sincerely thank you for sharing with us your valuable time. I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, our gold sponsor, Q Super, and our silver sponsor, the Queensland Police Credit Union. We're very grateful that they have uh, supported us and enabled us to host events such as this. So tonight, uh, we're going to hear about the fascinating pioneering history of the hospital in the first part of what may be a multi-part series, ultimately. Since the hospital opened on this Hurston site in 1867, the RBWH, as we know it, has been a hub for groundbreaking medical research and the development of novel treatment methods. We're the oldest and largest hospital in Queensland, and over the years, it's employed thousands of doctors, nurses, midwives, allied health professionals, researchers, and administrative staff to service the state's growing populations. Since the first nurses graduated from the hospital in 1888 and the University of Queensland Medical School opened next to this hospital in 1939, RBWH has fulfilled a significant teaching and research role with links to Queensland's major universities that are strengthening every day. So with the hospital's 150th anniversary being celebrated in early 2017, it's only just over a year away. Now is a very opportune time to bring past and present staff and students together under the auspices of the Royal Alumni, not only to celebrate the iconic Brisbane Institution and its history of medical excellence, but most importantly, the people involved. It is hoped that we can share with our alumni and our community some of the fascinating historic moments that have taken place on this campus and bring light to the people that have over time laid the foundation for the rest of us to create the world-class institution that it is today. Through these historic presentations, I hope that uh, we will be able to connect the history of our hospital with our present and our future. So now I would like to introduce to you our Master of Ceremonies this evening, Dr Cliff Pollard. Cliff has been instrumental in the organisation of this evening's presentations and as our resident historian has been a force behind the preservation of the hospital's history. So Cliff is going to act as our Master of Ceremonies and actually give one of the presentations himself. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Ian, thanks very much. Uh, I'm also an ex-surgeon. Uh, historian is my second life, uh, is also as well as being on the board of Metro North. It, thank you very much for coming. If you go outside, there's a number of books there, and there's a new one that's come on. It's The Apostle of Brisbane by about um, Joseph Canali. It's written by Father Patrick Tyne Tyn and one of our um, uh, priests here for many years. Uh, Joseph Canali came out as an engineer architect to finish the roof at St Stephen's, he subsequently became ordained, but as a layman and as a priest, he visited the hospital every day for 40 years to attend uh, his parish. He fell out of a tram in 1915, 
uh, and died. The next day he was fine, but then he subsequently became comatose and died a week later, probably of an extradural hematoma. Uh, he was taken to the martyr, as that was the hospital for all the Catholic clergy and nuns in that day, but certainly worth looking at if you're interested in the history. Now, the very first speaker, uh, is Jim Myers, the grandson of Errol Solomon Myers. Errol Solomon Myers, one of the foundation surgeons of this institution, expert in head and neck surgery, served in World War I on, on the Western Front, and one of the founding fathers of the medical school, University of Queensland. And Jim, he'll be talking about him, uh, his grandson, a background in teaching, but more recently he's been particularly involved in teaching and ethics and uh, has also been the Assistant Ombudsman, plus many other roles in the Queensland Government. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Cliff, and I hope I can live up to that big introduction. Public servant, you're probably going to be bored to death. I'll try not to do that. I'll try not to launch into public services and keep it real. Um, it's a great honour to be invited here tonight, and I'd like to thank Emily and the Foundation and Cliff for inviting me along. Um, I'd like to talk to you about my, my grandfather, Errol Solomon Myers. Now, I didn't know the man. Uh, he died in 1956, and as you can guess by my very youthful appearance, <laughs> I was born some time after that. Um, uh, just a few acknowledgements before we go into it too far. First of all, just an acknowledgement to the traditional owners on whose land we're gathered here this evening and uh, my respects to Elders uh, past and present. Um, I'd also like to pay some respects to some of my family members. You can see them gathered up there in the, in the central slide. I'll see if this pointer works, Emily. Yes. Might be a little bit too distant. Oh, no. That's uh, the eldest boy, Jack. He's passed away now. Some of you might have remembered Derek, Whoa. second, uh, third eldest. Um, he's passed away sadly too. Uh, the daughter, um, Alison, we called her Pally. Um, my father, Rod, who died in 69. Um, Errol's wife, Myrtle, <laughs> and his mother, Savine, who raised him as a um, basically a sole parent, which is interesting. Um, Moving on, uh, the title of today's uh, or tonight's speech is Has Time Healed All Wounds? And uh, some of you may be intrigued by that. What wounds did um, ES suffer? Well, he certainly suffered some in World War I. I'll tell you about those. But he also suffered wounds to his reputation and career because he had a nasty habit of what we Myers um, sometimes call speaking the truth to power. <laughs> and, um, and you'll see that got him into a bit of mischief. So let's move on. A um, bit of a caution, um, you are not receiving history from an unfiltered, unbiased source. I am E.S. Myers' grandson, so you'll, you'll maybe detect some bias in this, uh, in this talk. There is a beautiful pamphlet out the front there uh, on E.S.'s life, uh, and there's a collection at the State Library of Queensland, uh, which is going to be added to shortly, which has a whole lot of fascinating information about his early life. But just a quick summary. He was born on the 9th of August, 1890. Um, his mother, Savine, uh, was the daughter of a hotel keeper. They were Prussian immigrants. They immigrated to South Australia. His father, Ernest Ralph Myers, was a dentist from Liverpool. He didn't hang around too long. They were married in the uh, Brisbane synagogue. And uh, shortly after, he took off to Western Australia. So Ernest, sorry, uh, Errol was raised by uh, his mother. Uh, that's his younger brother there, Errol's the tall one in the beautiful hat, and that's Leslie. It's not a girl. <laughs> that's Leslie, his, his younger brother, who ended up becoming a uh, postal officer. There he is looking dapper down the bottom there uh, in, in his student days. Um, let's move on to his school and professional life. He attended Brisbane Grammar School uh, in, in his high schooling years after he attended the um, Southport State School. His mother ran the uh, Pacific and Grand Hotels at Southport. Um, so you can see there an interesting comment, obviously a future doctor in the making, that's an actual report <laughs> from the Brisbane Grammar School headmaster, the Reginald Hibber Rowe. Um, my next eldest brother has the same affliction, so it must be a genetic problem. Did pretty well at uni. And there he is, uh, 1915, probably somewhere up there, uh, looking very dapper in his white gear as a um, resident medical officer. He also did some GP work over in South Brisbane. 
He was the first licensed teacher of anatomy in Queensland and he taught dentists and there they are having a bit of fun with someone who's suffered from some terrible extractions. Um, oh, that's a bit busy. Just a few things. Let's pick out a few things. Um, you might guess from the surname that uh, the Myers family were Jews. Um, he married Myrtle, who was a, an accountant from Sydney in the great synagogue in Sydney in, in 1920. Um, 1921, he was appointed honorary assistant surgeon here at the Brisbane General. As Cliff said, he specialised in head and neck surgery, but did an awful lot of other things too. It's an awful lot of published papers on all manner of surgeries, including one my uncle told me about, where a gentleman was thrown from a horse and impaled on a very sharp object, and, and Errol was able to close the wound. And I think there's an international published paper on that. Um, not very pleasant. Um, there we go. Uh, first licensed teacher of anatomy. In 1941, he was elected Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, uh, which was usually the prerogative of, of a professor. Uh, he, he got an honorary title later in his, his career, you'll see, but um, he was a surgeon and a great honor to be appointed a Dean. And a whole lot of medical words there in the last one, which I won't even attempt to pronounce, but I'm sure means something to medical people. Um, and as I said, very versatile surgeon, apparently very well known and, and well respected for surgery more respected for teaching. Um, very eminent career in World War I, enlisted in 1917, so was already a doctor, signed up. He um, served in France. He was the regimental medical officer uh, for the 41st Battalion, which was a battalion formed uh, amongst Queenslanders and northern New South Welshmen. We let a few of those in. He, um, he fought um, around the Hindenburg line towards the end of the war, very nasty, bloody battles. He was wounded in action. He was gassed twice. Um, apparently, my uncle Jack's neighbour um, fought with him in the 41st, and they said one of the gassings, he just leapt up into no man's land to look after a wounded soldier, and they didn't see him again. So they sent out a search party and found him. Would have died had they not got him back. There's a very nice book um, published by the intelligence officers from the 41st, and they made a nice comment there. They said, the RMO Captain E.S. Myers did splendid work under the most trying circumstances, often dressing casualties under heavy shell fire. Indeed, he appeared to be indefatigable. By carrying on so gallantly, he has earned the sincerest admiration of all ranks. Probably not great senior ranks, <laughs> if I know my grandfather, but certainly the <laughs> military men looked up to him uh, for his hard work in saving many lives. Um, he was promoted major, and uh, he finally retired with the rank of... Lieutenant Colonel in the Australian Army Medical Corps and a Foundation Member of Legacy. Um, he's most known and most remembered for the hard work he did in pushing for a medical uh, school in Queensland. Um, they started planning, drew up plans and worked hard in 1932 as President of the BMA. Um, they really annoyed the government to try and get it happening. And finally in 1936, lo and behold, we got a, a medical school in Queensland. This is how we got into trouble. Um, after the Labor government uh, was ousted and the um, opposition came to power, as governments tend to do, they decided to pick on the former guys and see how hospitals were run. And um, Errol had the honour of representing the medical profession, spoke the truth to power and got people very upset. How dare they criticise the administrators. Um, This is my uncle talking here, Derek. Myers' role in, re in the Royal Commission had repercussions lasting more than 20 years. He was an object of distrust in hospital circles and non persona grata, both at the hospital and state department. Dean Myers was never going to be accepted as such by the hospital authorities. So Errol lived, um, or sorry, Derek lived in that milieu with his mother and father, um, obviously suffering some, uh, what we in government call payback um, for speaking the truth to power and payback had a particular nasty consequence in 1931 where a uh, patient of Errol's died in the uh, surgical um, ward up here after a particularly gruesome operation to remove a cancerous tumour under his tongue. And this um, information found its way to the Truth newspaper and uh, pressure from certain parties. And we have a Royal Commission featuring um, Errol's surgery of this patient eventually came out all right, um, but obviously a lot of reputational damage suffered as a result of that. Um, historians will tell you good primary source of evidence there. I think that photo sort of captures um, the regard that those medical students had for their Professor Joe. 
Um, he was a great fighter for the um, interests and the welfare of students and for good medical education in Queensland. Got into trouble again. Um, he got up the nose of the powers that be at university. Um, I think my colleagues, my two young medical students from the UQMS who are here tonight could uh, sympathise with this. This is Errol talking to the powers that be at university. Pedagogically speaking, it's unwise to overload the students with myriads of facts. And I know as a teacher of anatomy for over 30 years that the parts of anatomy students should really know are forgotten by the time they come to apply them. <laughs> Don't tell university administrators to change the curriculum. <laughs> it got a little bit worse than that. Um, relations really broke down and I've got the original correspondence, copies at home, and he gave him a bit of a serve there, basically saying that he'd been denied a hearing by the university authorities. He was the dean, he was trying to get things going well for the students. Um, and he reminded the University Senate of something that I sometimes say to some of my powers that be, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> Don't remember that phrase, ladies. <laughs> um, and that's him giving a really big serve uh, back to them, uh, to the university administrators. Um, this explains why there are no buildings named after my grandfather. <laughs> at the University of Queensland. Um, it did get better, um, and as often happens, uh, people are remembered more fondly after they've gone. The people who, who most, I think, revered and appreciated his work, apart from his patients, many of whom lived, um, were the students and the University of Queensland um, Medical Student Society, UCMS, have every year since his death held a uh, lecture in his honour, which I'm told is the largest public lecture in Queensland. It's had speakers including Imran Khan, Geoffrey Archer, Edmund Hillary, um, Victor Chan, and a whole range of very notable people um, presenting. Um, Justice Michael Kirby, he gave a great talk. Um, this year we have Megan, Professor Megan Davies from um, Sydney University, first Indigenous woman elected to the United Nations, giving a talk. Uh, 29th of September, <laughs> small plug. Um, and Certainly his legacy has lived on through this lecture. It's lived on through the medical school. Um, no doubt there are many people who are offspring of people today that uh, my grandfather saved through his surgery. Um, and uh, he certainly has a revered place in our family, even though many of us never got to meet him. We inherited all those bad traits and we continue to annoy those in power. Thank you. <laughs> We have time for some questions. Uh, Jim, are we happy to take some questions? So, to the best of my ability. <laughs> the, um, the ES Myers lectures, I think it was started by Cam Battersby, who was a surgeon here in the, in the faculty. So I'm fairly sure he started off. Would that be right, Liz? Do you remember that? I think it was Cam Battersby that started off the ES Myers lectures, from what I remember. Yeah. For those of you who have been, it really is a very full room, and there's some great lectures there. Uh, Sounds as if he didn't pull any punches. Question? Oh, Fred. I was just going to make a comment because one of the speakers was Charlie Teo, and yep. he would be very much reflected by your grandfather because he swam against the tide and still does and was persona non grata with many <laughs> senior groups. So I'm sure your grandfather was up there cheering. <laughs> Charlie Teo was stirring and spoke to a full house at the university. So that was fascinating hear about E.F. Myers, because you go to the lectures, but the background was great to introduce. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cliff. Thanks. The, the next speaker was to be Clooney Seeger, but um, unfortunately she um, uh, was taken ill yesterday and was admitted uh, to St Andrews. So I will step in and talk about uh, Christen Sorensen. So I think, uh, there you go. So. And if I get any of the slides wrong, uh, just text Clooney and tell her I've uh, disappointed her. But uh, she, born in 1885 in Sandgate, started training in the Brisbane Hospital in 1910, finished in 1913, and in 1914 enlisted very soon after the start of the First World War. 
that's a group of nurses there. We're trying to work out if she's actually in the photo, but we can't. And there, unfortunately, in all the photos, there are no names on the back of them. But the, the surgeon in the middle there is John Barr McLean, who's the medical superintendent, who served in World War I in Egypt and the Western Front. And he, he was a superintendent here for 30 years. Immediately sitting on his right is Dorothy Webb. And many of these, she served in uh, the Australian Army Nursing Service, as did many of them in that photo. But uh, one of the things they had to do, they had to scrub the floor. And they had to scrub it in the line of the grain and make sure it was beautifully clean. Uh, the board did try to introduce that uh, in recent years, but we don't think we'd get anywhere with that. OK. So as I said, she graduated in 1914 and enlisted, as so many of them did, very quickly. This is the Kayara. This was the hospital ship. You can see it in white with the painted cross there. Brisbane River, 21st of November, 1914. It's taking the first Australian General Hospital. It would pick up the second from Brisbane. The nurses and the doctors it would pick up the second Australian General Hospital from Sydney, the first and second Australian casualty clearing stations and also uh, for, uh, stationary hospitals and the first Australian casualty clearing station, mostly Tasmanians, and that would serve on Gallipoli for the nine months, really never leaving the beach for that period of time, had a very small area of land. Very interesting. There's a lot of books written about that trip and the, the Melbourne surgeons couldn't stand the Sydney surgeons. And in fact, the Melbourne surgeons regarded the Sydney, University of Sydney, they were bounders. No one spoke to them. The West Australians, they didn't want to know who they were. They, weren't, they were just not gentlemen. Fascinating story. You had to go to Melbourne or Adelaide. And of course, there was no medical school in Queensland, as we've just heard. So most of our surgeons actually came from either Sydney or many of them from Melbourne, such as Ernest Sandra Jackson and John Barr McLean. So off they went. That's Kristen Sorensen. What she did, many of our nurses were actually seconded to the British Army, to Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. So she was seconded to them, served on the hospital ship, the Guildford Castle, which brought the wounded out of Gallipoli to Egypt, uh, to Lemnos subsequently, and to Malta. But she also served on some of the hospital transports, going after spending some time in Pune in India and in Abyssinia. She was also on some of the transports, bringing back the wounded to um, Australia. So that's a shot of her in India. But then subsequently, in 1916-17, she became the principal matron of the 60th British General Hospital. Remember that we had quite a number of general hospitals. We had a number of casualty clearing stations, but nothing compared to the size of the British Army that was so much bigger. This is the 60th British General Hospital. It's in Salonika, and she was a principal matron of a 2,000 bed tented hospital with all the problems that they had. And here, she won the Royal Red Cross for her service, regarded as the White Dove. The uniform, I think, and I could easily be corrected on this, is probably that of Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service and not that of the Australian Army Nursing Service. The comments on her service are just phenomenal. So she's sitting there, she's on the left of a British general, uh, there you go, on the left-hand side of God in the British Army. And it was said of her that quite a number of cases she actually dragged back out of the grave by her assiduous care. After the war, she came back. Enormous career. And as I give many of these talks around Brisbane, uh, Probus Clubs and Rotary, there are many elderly retired nurses sitting in the audience who say, we trained under Christine Sorensen. One of the things we want to do and what the Nursing Museum wants to do is interview some of these people and get some memories while they're still fresh. She was matron of Rosemount after the war. And remember, it was a repat hospital until Greenslopes was built in 1946. She then went to the hospital for sick children. And then in 1928, came to the, uh, what was then the Brisbane Hospital, but it was the Brisbane and South Coast Hospitals Board from Brisbane to the Gold Coast, uh, the border actually. She was the matron for all of that through the Great Depression, the building, rebuilding program of the 1930s, and so many of us here will know those tower blocks, the six floors, the open verandas, the people on the verandas, the rain coming in. Okay, many of us walk through those as students. I can't remember that house in front, actually. Some of you might remember that. So the Great Depression, the rebuilding, and of course, the enormous challenges of the Second World War, 
So once the threat became very real with bombing in Darwin, the then Brisbane Hospital had to plan for 1,200 extra beds in case we were bombed. So they had beds in schools, the Diamantina on the Southwise was set up, and the university building at St Lucia, which had only just been finished, was set up with private, as operating rooms in case we needed casualties. The, the Brisbane and South Coast Hospital wards had to look after at least 160 first aid shelters in the, around and about Brisbane where there were bomb shelters and first aid uh, staff there. So they had to supply them with people and with equipment in case they were needed. A huge effort she was responsible for along with the board at that time. A tremendous job. Fortunately, nothing happened. And of course, the exhibition ground was a staging post for all the Allied forces coming through there. Enormous camps here. She oversaw all that. Very enthusiastic about training of nursing, keen to make sure that the nursing school here was one of the best in the country. And there's a great story about her that Clooney's told me I must tell. Um, so, is Marcia here? That's her. Is Marcia Cowley here? Is she actually here? She was going to come, but um, apparently when she was a student nurse, you had to boil the urine to test it. They didn't have any of those nice little strips. So, she was boiling the union. In, in, some of you remember that? She's, she's there. Okay. Good. Yeah, over the Bunsen burner. That's right, over the Bunsen burner. Yeah. And anyway, it boiled and she sprayed it all in, um, in the direction of Miss Sorensen. And she was, fortunately, she was able to jump out of the way before she got splashed in all of this. And after this catastrophic offence, Matron Sorensen calmed Marcia down and assured her not to worry, and she passed the examination. And Marcia described her as serene and benevolent. I'm glad, we, I'm glad it wasn't Errol, Errol Solomon Myers if we did the same thing too. We might have been in trouble. <laughs> or, or some of the other professors of surgery that I remember. John Monash said that she was eminently qualified by temperate, temperament, disposition and training. And Matron Wren of the Australian Army Nursing Service said, I could not speak too highly of her tact and ability to cope with the difficulties that arose in the hospitals in which she worked. And if you have to think, the, so many of these women that served in this hospital and went to World War I treated hundreds and hundreds of casualty orphans within a few days in, in uh, Egypt, the first Australian General Hospital, and then in the casualty clearing stations on the Western Front. They did all this and then they came back to Brisbane and um, many of them actually didn't go back into the public system. Chris Hentz did, some of them didn't, and they, um, they went back into private uh, hospitals because it would have been very difficult to fit back into this environment after you've been to France or Gallipoli. She would then um, um, retire subsequently in 1951, awarded the MBE after that and uh, passed away. Christian Sorensen died on the 2nd of January 1958. Clearly one of the great uh, matrons of this hospital, one of the great nurses uh, of Australia, the Australian Army Nursing Service, and um, clearly one of the great um, um, girls to come out of Sandgate. Uh, I could answer, you could ask me some questions, but I'll see how I go. I've, I've finished well ahead of time. There's a whole swag of photos of her taken with politicians and that in the 1930s, visits by the governor. Uh, this, of course, was the major hospital in the state. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette, you're next. You're next? Yes. Uh, up you come. Jeanette uh, it will be talking on another great nurse, uh, Agnes Isambad. Jeanette's vice president of the uh, Royal Brisbane Hospitals Nursing Association she trained here, did midwifery at the women's and then travelled widely, working in London and New Zealand. Where she, in New Zealand, she helped establish the South Auckland Hospital. Keen interest in palliative care, worked at Mount Olivet, now St Vincent's, and uh, the very big interest in the military history and in the nursing history of this institution. And Jeanette uh, will be talking about Agnes Isambard. Thanks.
Hi. Thank you for coming and thank you for your interest in the history of this great hospital of ours. When the Brisbane Hospital moved from George Street to Hurston in 1867, the hospital committee searched for ways to improve patient care. The nursing care was inadequate, so they appointed Sister Annie Miller. Sorry, this is the first time I've used one of these, so be patient with me. Um, Annie Miller was one of Florence Nightingale's recruits. Um, the colonial secretary in New South Wales had asked in England that some of Florence's nurses come out, so Annie was one of those. She took up the position on February, in February of 1871, but she resigned after one month. She was apparently a rather temperamental woman and quite unable to cope with the power struggle when the medical staff were unwilling to hand over any of its responsibilities to the nursing staff. Things went from bad to worse during the 1870s, with the old fever wards filled to overflowing, with typhoid spreading rapidly. Standards slipped. An untrained matron resigned in 1876, and the next head of nursing was dismissed for alcoholism. <laughs> Our guardian angel came in the form of a very young Dr Ernest Sanford Jackson in 1882, who ensured that nursing at the hospital was permanently reformed. New fever wards had been built in 1880 and were still filled with typhoid sufferers. When Dr Jackson took charge, he visited the fever ward to find no nurses there. They were all at lunch. He initiated a roster system, insisting that one nurse be in the wards at all times. He disciplined the night nurses for sleeping on duty. Now, a lot of the nurses didn't like this. A lot of the nurses actually threatened to strike, and quite a lot of them actually left. Um, so life could not have been easy for Dr Sanford Jackson, who failed to attract any trained nurses to Brisbane until 1885 when Mary, sorry, that's the time, I'm no good at this, I tell you, when Mary Whedon came, um, she was appointed head nurse, and together they began to improve nursing care. Domestic and nursing duties were separated, and the nurses were introduced to uniforms, a code of behaviour was put into practice, and nurses were educated. Dr. Jackson led, lectured in medicine, surgery, anatomy and physiology, and Miss Whedon lectured in bandaging, first aid and practical nursing. Their courses lasted, la, lasted for 18 months, and the first exams were held in 1888 and certificates were issued. In 1889, sisters were required to remain in the hospital for 12 months after completing their training course. Miss Whedon resigned in October of 1890 to take charge of a private hospital in Tenerife. Miss Elizabeth Cross succeeded her. Still, the typhoid patients poured in and a special fever hospital was established in Victoria Park to house the overflow. Help was at hand in the form of Dr Francis Washington Everard Hare. He introduced his typhoid bath the baths were made by the carpenters at the hospital. They were lined with galvanised iron, filled with 75 gallons of tepid water, and moved around the ward by nurses. And we think our job's heavy. If a patient's temperature went above 102.2, they were stripped naked, sponged in iced water, placed on a canvas stretcher with a little pillow, and lowered into the water for 10 minutes. The treatment could be repeated two to four hourly, and apparently many patients developed a hatred of this, and they had to be coaxed with morphine or brandy. <laughs> Mortality dropped from 14.8% to 7.8%. We have a letter in the Nurses' Museum dated 1885, written by Sister Jeannie Davis to her sister Sissy in England. The typhoid wards here are the largest in the whole colony and hold 54 men and 45 women. 
and as soon as they are able to be moved, they take them to a convalescent home in Sandgate. <coughs> Enter our heroine, Agnes Katerina Isenberg. She was born in Ipswich in 1874 and trained at the Brisbane Hospital from 1897 to 1899. Nurses work 12 hours each day with half a day off each week. Their uniforms consisted of a close-fitting bodice high up to the neck, a fully pleated skirt to the ground, a white starched bibbed apron with straps which crossed at the back. The uniform was completed with a stiffly starched collar, cuffs and belt and a small cap edged in lace. Probationers were paid four shillings and sixpence a week. Agnes was among the first nurses to live in the Lady Lamington Nurses Home, which was opened in 1897. Our records show that she worked mostly in the surgical wards and left on <coughs> August the 18th, 1890, having passed her exams. On the 1st of July, 1902, the Australian Army Nurses Service was initiated. Agnes joined the reserves as a matron from 1902 to 1914. The nurses were paid a pound a year and had to provide their own uniforms, which cost five pounds. When Agnes completed her training, she firstly worked at the Combsley Plague Hospital, which was situated on the south bank of the Brisbane River, about eight kilometres from the CBD. The threat of plague had profound effects on the public health and sanitation of Brisbane. It was known that plague was transmitted by fleas from infected rats, so gangs of rat catchers and dogs were employed. And those of you of my age can probably remember they were still around in the 1950s. The hospital at Combsley was moved to the Brisbane Hospital in 1908, and Agnes went too as charge nurse. She spent three years there. The infectious disease ward was described as being badly ventilated, badly lit and quite unsuitable for treating patients with infectious diseases. But it was not until 1910 that plans for the new Wattlebrae were mooted, but it was not erected until 1930 by the Brisbane City Council who were responsible for treating infectious diseases. The building stands today as a Lowson House. Psychiatric patients were being nursed in Old Ward 16, which is now where the security people are, which was unsuitable. So they were moved to Lowson House in 1958. It was named after James Lowson, who was the first practicing psychiatrist in Brisbane. Back to Agnes. And in 1911, we find her as matron of St Mary's Private Hospital in Ipswich, where she remained until the outbreak of World War I. She enlisted on the 11th of November 1914 and her medical examination forms dated the 19th of November were signed by Dr Lillian Cooper and they tell us that she was five feet two and a quarter inches tall, she weighed 135 pounds, had fair complexion, blue eyes and brown hair. She was aged 40 years and four months. Agnes must have been by far the oldest nurse to board the Kiara at Pinkenbar Wharf on the 21st of November. They reached Port Sayed on the 20th of January 1915 and disembarked for Cairo where they were paid. Agnes received three pounds and wrote in her diary a godsend as I was stony broke. Their destination was the Heliopolis Palace Hotel which was taken over as a hospital. She discovered that she'd been made junior matron. Her duties at this time consisted of linen checks, changing bed status, and the control of other nurses. She was older and trained in army ways, so the younger sisters found her very strict. The first casualties from Gallipoli began to arrive in Cairo on the 28th of April, 1915. More than 2,000 cases were admitted between 5 p.m and 11pm on that day. One can only imagine what it was like for the staff. Agnes's diary for the 1st of May. Another train load of wounded arrived at midnight. About a hundred very badly wounded, a great number of whom were going to die. 
Oh, the horror of this war. The boys are so proud of themselves and they're so good about their wounds and dressings. So many are going to be crippled and lose their limbs. Doctors operated all night, not going to bed till 5 a.m. Theatre nurses also, and most of the day staff stayed up until after midnight. It brings out the best in everyone. Agnes diligently kept her diary. As a devout Catholic, she attended Mass regularly and always made sure that the chaplain was called to dying patients. She notes her distress when one of our girls from Brisbane, Norma Mowbray, died from pneumonia. She describes how she and five other nurses walked beside the pallbearers following the coffin covered by the Union Jack. At the cemetery, they were met by a guard of honour and escorted to the graveside together with two chaplains. After a brief service, the firing party fired three volleys and the last post was sounded. Norma's parents must have received solace knowing she had been treated with such respect. Agnes was very critical of some of the doctors and their treatment, particularly the shell-shocked diggers. Some of the doctors labelled them as malingerers. She will also be very critical of the soldiers' behaviour. One example, a boy of about 18 was brought in tonight, drunk. I told him he should be put over his mother's knee and smacked. On May, the 16, uh, May of 1916, Agnes was transferred to number three section sea transport staff as matron, a post she held until she was discharged as medically unfit on the 5th of September 1919. She had a goiter and she suffered from cardiac arrhythmia. She was appointed principal matron of Northern Command, a position she held until 1924. She never married and she died in June of 1956. Agnes's diary paints a tragic picture of what it was like to be a nurse during world, the world to end all wars. Can I just conclude with a quote from the Christchurch Star dated the 3rd of November, 1915. While men fight one another, women tend the wounded, and there can be no doubt at all that theirs is the nobler part. Naturally enough, the eyes of the world are on the firing line, and sometimes the work of the nurses from the very firing line to the hospitals is overlooked. It was ever thus. Those who scar the tree of life, a great thinker once said, are remembered by the scars, but those who water its roots have nothing by which they may be known but theirs is the tree. Thank you. So, any questions for Jeanette? Wonderful paper. Any questions? I think Agnes was probably our most senior experienced military nurse, wasn't she? Yep. Yeah, she'd enlisted very early and uh, when the first group was sent to Gallipoli in the first fleet, they kept her back, didn't they? So she would go with the Kaiara uh, to give them the benefit of her experience. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful movie. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Robin Cook, anatomic pathologist. Uh, Robin was head of the Department of Anatomic Pathology here at the RBWH, the RBH before that, for 23 years. And prior to that, worked in New Guinea as an interest uh, in infectious diseases as well as pathology, and also as a major interest in looking at the specimens from World War I. Robin's been able to get um, autopsy specimens from soldiers who were killed in World War I and is working on those at the moment. He'll be talking about uh, Dr. Edward Holbrook Derrick in Q Fever. Robin, thanks very much. Thanks, Cliff. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you about Edward Derrick and what he did in my lifetime. But first, let me tell you about the, um, about the state of pathology in the first and second quarters of the 20th century. <coughs> 
Scientific medicine, as we know it, was formulated in the second half of the 19th century, 1850 to 1900 or thereabouts. Towards the end of this period, the great discovery was that many diseases were caused by living organisms. The new specialty of bacteriology was being promulgated by Louis Pasteur from Paris and Robert, Robert Koch from Berlin. Closer to 1900, the French physician Alphonse Laveron found living organisms in the blood of patients who had the clinical condition that was recognised as malaria. This was called malaria because of bad air from the swamps. This was one of the new infectious, infectious agents, parasites. The English physician Patrick Manson showed that filariasis, which was a parasitic disease, was transmitted by the bite of mosquitoes. And Ronald Ross followed up by showing that malaria too was transmitted by the bite of mosquitoes. This opened the way for a new specialty, entomology, with a study of vectors. And how, how can they be classified? What are their habits and how can they be controlled? In Brisbane and in many other parts of the world, there were doctors who would not accept this explanation for the cause of disease, and there were many fierce public fights between doctors in Brisbane who believed the researchers and those who clung to the teaching that disease was caused by miasms in the environment. One of the positive results that came from the terrible conditions under which the soldiers of the combatant armies in World War I suffered was that clinical doctors were taking detailed notes and pathologists and lab workers were taking meticulous cultures of all the wounds and other conditions that were prevalent. Reading the history of the war with a medical eye, it's clear that this resulted in the proper correlation between the clinical and the research laboratory findings of the previous 50 or so years. And now let me set the scene of pathology in Brisbane in the first part of the 20th century. Enter James Vincent Dewey, who was a Queensland doctor who served with the army in World War I. And here, oops, here he is in the centre of this uh, first group of medical students to do pathology. At the end of the, so he, at the end of the war, he took a six month rehabilitation course in clinical pathology at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Then he, like all the others who had been doing laboratory work during the war, returned to civilian life and they had to try to learn a living by doing clinical pathology. This was a new specialty and it took years before its value was realised by doctors and the public. Pathologists had to do other work to be able to pay for their pathology tests. In 1918, when he returned to Brisbane, there was no position for a pathologist in Brisbane, so he took jobs as GP locums and giving anaesthetics. The other way that pathologists earned money in those days was by doing uh, bacteriology tests on water and food for city councils. The, the payment for clinical tests and anatomical pathology didn't, did not exist. So in 1919, he was, he was appointed to establish a pathology service at the Mater Hospital. This was an unpaid job. Um, and so, he and so he started up a private practice. Now on the left we have the first, the eighth report of the Mater Hospital. And here we see that they notified the fact that James Dewey was appointed the honorary um, pathologist. In 19, oh, these are some of the tests they did. In 19, whoops, in 1919 and in 1924. You'll see that there were not very many tests offered and there were not very many tests completed, either in 1919 or in 1924. Now in 1925, he established a histopathology service at the Brisbane General Hospital in a laboratory that was first established in 1911. Here's the first histology report in the Brisbane Hospital. You'll see that it's light on for clinical history and gross examination, rectum. Uh, I, I have cut out the name of the patient, but the name of the doctor is not recorded, 
the age and sex is not recorded, but because she's recorded as Mrs. R. Shams she's a female. So we have a female rectum and the, the very cryptic pathology report, adenocarcinoma. This was the first report in 29-7-1925. Now, in three months, a couple of months later, two months later, uh, a blood test, which was a, a Wasserman reaction for the presence of syphilis, a serological test, and that was done uh, and recorded on the same handwritten file. Uh, now, the next one is a cyst from the forehead. And this, the clinical uh, provisional diagnosis was neoplastic changes. You'll see that it took four days to get the report, and it's because squamous epithelium very advanced. Now, I'm not quite sure what that really means, <laughs> but probably it was a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, but who knows? Um, Dr. Whedon again. Dr. Whedon, this is the uncle of David Whedon. I will say that, again, the, we now have a little bit more information. This was a prostate gland and the clinical history section. And that took a week to get a report. And the report said cystic proliferating adenoma of definitely malignant tendency. So, again, goodness knows whether that was benign or malignant. Uh, but we do have some blood urea tests. So this is a biochemical serology test and a then repeat bi biochemical test. And here's a snipping from the face. Uh, we don't have a date for it, but it was in 1930. And I don't think very much had changed from 1920 to 1930, uh, and probably not very much changed up to the 1950s. So this was a sort of pathology report that was given at the time. Um, we used to have these reports filed away in our records, but I'm not quite sure whether they're still there now. And here they are at the Christmas party in 1930. And this was in the basement of the Children's Hospital of the day. So there is the first um, scientist, that was Lulu Crawford. Behind her is um, the pathologist, this is George Taylor. George Taylor was uh, James Dewey's brother-in-law. And he did two weeks, two, two months, two years of training in pathology at, at St George's Hospital in London. And then he came back and was the first full-time pathologist at the, at the Brisbane Hospital. Then we have a paediatrician and then the superintendent of the Children's Hospital, Dr Patterson. And this is James Vincent Dewey, one of the laboratory staff. Um, uh, Nancy Sylvester, who was still around when I came, and then this was another one. So this was the full hospital staff, and he was a senior man, Ernie Pitcher. Now, those of you who are surgeons may recall this man. This was, um, uh, you probably, none of you would have been students by the time he was shot by one of his um, uh, un or dissatisfied patients, a man called Carl Kast. And he came along and shot a, a couple of the, pedi the orthopedic surgeons. This was um, uh, Matt Stubbs Brown, Tom Stubbs Brown. And I think one of the other ones was shot as well, but he survived. But Stubbs Brown was killed. Now, now let me introduce to you Edward Ford, who was the main person that I want to talk to today. He was a shy and self-effacing man. I met him a few times before he died, and I've come to know him much better after reading at length the papers that he left in the QIMR. And when Laurie Powell became the Director of Pathology, and I was on the point of leaving the hospital, full-time staff, he said, you'll have some spare time. Why don't you go and have a look at some of the, the boxes of documents that Derek, Derek had left? So I did that, and um, so I got to know Derek a little better. Now, this was his CV, born in 1896 and died in 1976. He announced the finding of Q fever in the MJA article in August 1937. In 1920, he graduated University of Melbourne. 21, he did a hospital clinical appointment. 22, he did postmortem-based research. In those days, pathology was anatomical pathology or morbid anatomy postmortems. There was virtually no surgical pathology. 
1923, he went to London looking for a job. And he had trouble getting a job in London, and I think he was assisted in getting a job in the pathology department by Conrad Hirschfeld, who was working as a surgical registrar there at the time. And his job in the London hospital was to dissect carefully the postmortem lungs, particularly of patients who died from TB. And TB was extremely common in those days. Almost everybody who died had some evidence of TB at the postmortem. So there's Derek in the back row. And here is the professor at the London Hospital, Hubert Turnbull. I remember his second name, <laughs> Roger. Uh, so Hubert Turnbull was professor at the London Hospital, and he was becoming, and then became, the most senior uh, pathologist in, in the UK. I've got a story about him later if we have a little bit of time. Uh, I gave this hospital, this uh, photograph back to the London Hospital archives because they didn't have a copy. Now, in the Christmas of 1923, uh, Derek and um, John Lee's father, John Lee's father was working in England at the time, and they were medical students together and very good friends. And they went to London, to Paris, for the Christmas holidays. And Derek started coughing up blood, and he knew that he had TB because many of his family and other close friends had TB. So he decided he would come back to Australia as quickly as possible. So that was on a ship. And then he decided that if he was going to die, he, would, uh, he wouldn't pursue his pathology, he would do general practice. So for the next 10 years or so, he was a locum general practitioner up and down the east coast of Australia, probably spitting his acid fast bacilli all over his, um, his patients. But his last uh, appointment was in 1935 in the Irvine Bank Hospital. There was a tin mine at the time in Atherton Tableland. And as you know, mines have, a, as they are now, have a great tendency to disappear, mining towns. So by this time, having survived 10 years, he must have decided that he was not going to die from TB. So he married the matron of the hospital and obtained a job in Brisbane. So here is the, the throbbing heart of the tin mine in Irvine Bank in about 1935. And you'll see that these general practice locums must not have had very much experience of either clinical medicine and certainly none, none of pathology. So this is the hospital of which he was in charge at that time and there's probably one of those is his future wife. Now enter Raphael Salento, 1893 to 1985. Some of you, uh, I doubt whether any of us would have remembered Raphael himself, but uh, they would know some of his sons and daughters. Uh, now Raphael had become an expert in public health and tropical medicine after working for a number of years in New Guinea, in Rabaul, and also in Malaya. And then he was appointed the Director General of Health and Medical Services by William Forgan Smith, uh, who was leading a new Labor government in Queensland in 1934. And he had big plans to develop a, um, um, a state-run service which provided the state would look after everybody. And there was a very nice report from the uh, health department that I found in Derek's papers describing what they were doing in the first three years that they were in, 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 in government. And they had done all sorts of things and developed everything and they were going to be all things to all people. This was the welfare state. And when people look at um, the problems of nursing of uh, asylums and orphanages and everything now, they should really look at them in the spirit in which they were set up by this very um, active Labor government. They were done in the very best of good intentions and every, everybody they employed was the same nature. But we're judging now without taking account of what was happening in the past. So here's Raphael Salento. 
about that time. He saw the need to have a medical head of the public health laboratory that had been in existence since 1898. A, what was called a bacteriological institute was established about this time to investigate outbreaks of plague in Brisbane. So there were a number of small outbreaks of the plague and there was a lot of uh, a lot of infighting between doctors as to how you diagnose the plague and all that sort of thing. But their test included, uh, test, so what they did mainly was the plague. And then he convinced, so this may sound familiar, uh, he was the Director General of Health, so he wanted to, to appoint somebody new to the, uh, to the job of government pathologist. At that time, the forensic autopsies were done by a whole lot of uh, part-time medical staff who were recruited and paid. So uh, Salento said to the government of the day, who were questioning how much money they were going to be paying, they were paying this, this man an absolute fortune, which was the smallest salary in, in Australia at the time for that sort of a job. But anyhow, Salento said, well, if we sack all these full-time people and then we appoint him, we'll get him to do all those things and also look after the laboratory and we'll be saving money because we'll be spending less money on his salary than we were on the part-time people. And that, I think, is still fairly uh, par for the course. So this is Ted Derrick at about the time that he was appointed to the job of uh, pathologist. Now, considering the state of pathology and probably most other aspects of medical practice in Brisbane at the time, and the CV of the applicant with no recent work in pathology, uh, how could anyone have predicted the national and international honours that this man would receive and how much we would, he would contribute to the advancement of medical science in Brisbane? And his legacy can be seen in the current Institute, Queensland Institute of Medical Research and elsewhere. So immediately on his appointment, he was uh, using all the tools of morbid anatomy, histopathology, experimental pathology, bacteriology, parasitology, entomology, serology and epidemiology, all of which were being developed in the best universities in Europe and in America, but not exactly in Queensland. So he was also dealing with newly recognised organisms. The Rickettsiae had just been introduced. Viruses had just become uh, uh, known about in 1930. So in July of 1935, he was appointed pathologist in, with a, in Brisbane with a staff of four. None of them had tertiary education. And this laboratory would be condemned on every modern criterion. Doing the public health work and the forensic work for less money than he'd been paid in part-timers before him. Now here is his laboratory and the laboratory staff. It was on the second floor of the what was then the Department of Health and Home Affairs. It's now the Sandstone Building that's run by the National trust in William Street and the pathology department was on the level below the street on the left hand side. And so these were the four members of staff. The man in the, and you see the, the quality of the microscopes and the background information. This man was the chief um, uh, scientist, not, not qualified scientist, but his name was um, Metalblock. And here you see he was dissecting uh, rats looking for plague bacilli, no gloves. I presume there were no such things as surgical gloves in those times. But it's no wonder that ultimately he got um, Q fever <laughs> and other things. So here he is, Hubert Brown. Now Ted Derrick, when you go through his papers, he was great for cutting out newspaper articles about the patients that he'd examined and about anybody of interest. So here you see when he was retired in 1960, uh, this was the retirement of his right hand, left hand and every other hand man, without whom there's no way in the world he would have been able to do what he did. And here he is in, the, in a better laboratory at the time of his retirement in 1960. Now, in 1935, August, which was the month after he was appointed, Raphael came along and said, 
I'd like you to investigate the cause of some undiagnosed fevers uh, that are affecting the workers at the Cannon Hill Abattoir in Brisbane. Just in passing, there were no cases in the nearby Borthwick's abattoir. Now, it was physicians at the Mater Hospital who were having these patients, and so they wanted to know what was the cause of this funny, funny um, fever that they were getting. And they couldn't, could not call it abattoir fever because that was very bad publicity. Nobody would want to work there, and we wouldn't be able to sell the meat to the overseas people. So here, is, here are the, the abattoirs in 1925. Uh, uh, this one was the Borthwick's one, and as it turned out, this one was doing uh, was was killing cows and old cattle for the domestic market, and that's where they were getting the Q fever. This one was having they were killing steers for the overseas market, and um, they weren't getting Q fever there. So that was some an epidemiological um, uh, factor, and that's very important when we look at the cause of Q fever. Now, he consulted the physicians at the Mata Hospital who had reported the cases. And all, all together, they concluded that it may be a rickettsial infection, but it differed from other cases because there was no skin rash. One of the rickettsial infections they had at that time was scrub typhus, and that had a skin rash. So again, one of Derek's, um, among Derek's papers, we have his cuttings from the paper, he was in 1974, really just a year or two before he died. He was still an avid collector of material. And this was the, um, the obituary of one of those doctors who helped him with the clinical investigation of the Q fever patients. And this 1939, just after he'd published his main paper in 1937, they started looking for looking at the domestic, at the the animals, uh, the native animals, to see whether any of them had um, Q fever. And one of the animals that they found were bandicoots, and the bandicoot ticks had Q fever. So he thought that this might be a good way of finding it. But the problem was the ticks would not bite. So. <laughs> Uh, what is now his his, um, his friend Hugh Brown put his hand into the into the bag where they had all the ticks and the ticks just wouldn't bite him, but he accidentally got the crucial experiment because just before some of the young fit soldiers were sent off to the Second World War, they camped on North Bradbrook Island, and that was infested with ticks full of uh, uh, scrub t uh, full of. Um, uh, Sorry, it was inspected by bandicoots, all of which had ticks with Q fever. So after a month, nobody in the, the army units had got Q fever. So he stopped doing any further experiments on seeing whether ticks would transmit Q fever. Now, that, that um, uh, observation in 1939 was really very important because it was... Well, but when the, when the disease was first identified, it was thought that it was a specific disease peculiar to South East Queensland. But quite quickly, it became known to be a disease all over the world. Now, so between... And he got his first cases in, on the 13th and 14th of September. Now, considering his non-background in pathology, methodology and everything else, he must have been corresponding with some of the people doing rickettsial work in Malaya and South Africa because immediately he got his first cases on day one. He started doing rickettsial investigations like a pro. He, invest he injected these patients uh, their serum and their urine into guinea pigs and then showed that the guinea pigs got fever and a big spleen. And then, uh, so clearly they were getting infected. And then he transmitted the infection from one guinea pig to the next, to the next, to the next. So clearly it was a, a viable living infectious agent. Now, the, the case three presented uh, new problems because this was a dairy farmer who had little contact with the abattoirs. And so the infection must have come from a rural source outside the abattoir. And so by Christmas in 1935, he'd done the following. With Hubert Brown, he'd established a protocol for examining rickettsial infections. 
They were guinea pigs in the laboratory because they used to use guinea pigs for testing patients for tuberculosis because every uh, acid fast bacillus was not tuberculosis. And I, so Hubert Brown was then faced with the task of uh, breeding, looking after, labelling and keeping tab on all of these new guinea pigs which they had to breed. Now they found how to take rectal temperatures of guinea pigs. Nobody had done that before, at least it wasn't in the literature. So they learned how to do that. And then in the course of their investigations in the next three or four years, they did 100 rectal temperatures a day and they used about 7,000 guinea pigs. So they established a protocol for recording their results. On each patient, he performed all of the tests then available for the diagnosis of cause of a fever. And they were all negative. So here he is doing uh, rectal temperatures on guinea pigs. By this time, those glass jars, he put two guinea pigs in each of the glass jars and with, with um, uh, bedding on the bottom. So every day, all this bedding had to be changed and they invited a, a courier mail reporter to come and report on all of this. So she reported beautifully in the courier mail on all of this, all of this laboratory with all the benches covered with these little bottle boxes full of guinea pigs. Now the guinea pigs sometimes got out and that was a real problem then they had to chase them all around the, the lab to, um, to find them. One of, one of the other problems from the safety point of view of this laboratory was that it, it was entered by a single door which came off the inside. So when John Tong came along, he wrote to the administration and said, what do we do if there's a fire? Because we have to come out the one door. So he got back a letter from the administration which said, in case of fire, get yourself a long rope, tie it to the, <laughs> to the uh, plumbing and let yourselves out the window. <laughs> So Neville Stallman, who worked in the lab for 40 years, said he, he kept this rope at his feet <laughs> for the 40 years that he was in the building and they fortunately didn't have to use it. Now, the disease... So, this is some of the other things he found. The disease was caused by an effective agent because it, it caused a temperature and splenomegaly in guinea pigs. It could be transmitted to other guinea pigs by inf injection of the infected tissue, but not by contact or by eating food inoculated with the infected material. Once infected, a guinea pig was immune, and this formed the basis of a laboratory test. So they had a laboratory test for testing people with fever to see if they had Q fever. And he called it Q fever, query fever, because he didn't know the answer, and um, they didn't want to call it abattoir fever. So the organism was the same for all of the patients because it would infect um, guinea pigs that had not been exposed, but the guinea pigs that had been exposed and were immune didn't get the infection. So the organism was probably a rickettsia and not a virus because it did not pass through a sites filter, which was one of the characteristics of a virus, and he saw things in the first imprints that he thought might have been rickettsiae. It was different from the known rickettsia apart from the clinical features. Uh, guinea pigs from all of the other rickettsial diseases developed gangrene necrosis of the testes, but there was no gangrene of the testes in his um, guinea pigs. So he identified the main clinical features and he demonstrated the incubation period of 21 days. Other things, he tried to infect other experimental animals. Five of eight rats became infected. A few mice were injected, but they were not infected. He unsuccessfully treated the disease with sulfosphenamine, which was the only sulfur drug available at the time. He tried to infect guinea pigs in different ways, as we said, by injection, by putting them together, by feeding them with the, uh, with the organisms. Um, but and, Sorry. And then he tested for the properties, the temperature, the drying, the freezing, how stable were they? And they were, as it turned out, they were very stable indeed. But on one occasion, Derek was not sure whether the organism was very sensitive. So to inject his guinea pigs quickly, he had Hubert Brown bring a guinea pig to the bedside of one of the patients. So they took the blood, Derek injected the, the blood into the guinea pig, and the guinea pig promptly died on the spot. <laughs> much, much to the chagrin of everybody, <laughs> including the patient. 
that, as it turns out, they were, they were terribly stable. And hence he concluded that the organism was somehow brought with animals from the rural areas to the abattoir, and he thought it was a tick. Looking for a reservoir, he did absolutely everything he could think of. He pulled the blood, he looked at it, and so on. All negative. And Derek thoroughly investigated gate three, case three, which was a dairy farmer from the Brisbane Valley who had minimal contact with the abattoir. He visited the farm, he looked for sick animals, ticks, injected milk into guinea pigs. Milk was the way that the first cases of um, Q fever were dis distributed or spread in London uh, in about 19, uh, in the 1960s, 1950s. And he had no luck, but had no luck with injecting guinea pigs um, uh, with milk. They just died. Now let us look at the original laboratory notes that I found in one of the boxes of books and records that he left at the QIMR. They were inside a cover from a school exercise book and tied with legal red tape. Waste not, what not, was the dictum of the depression, and Derek carried this to ultimate extremes. I think that he and I were probably the only ones who've ever read these notes. So there's the exercise book, and inside were the notes, seven of them. And I wondered at the time, when I first looked at them, what Q1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 meant. And then I realised that these were probably case numbers 1 to 7 of the nine cases that he reported in 1937. And then I got to look at them. So this is case, these are the first three cases, all done in the first three months that he started doing this. And really he had it all sewn up in that time. So this is the drawing of his very first case, of first guinea pig. And he, he looked at these things and wondered whether they might be rickettsia. And in the ninth case, so that was case N1, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, he says again, look at these things. They look the same as we had in case one. Do you think they looked like this? And this was the, uh, the definitive finding of rickettsia by uh, McFarlane Burnett. So, and again, in, in another case, he says, no rickettsia, no rickettsia. So clearly, he was thinking rickettsia from the time of the clinical examination right up to all of his investigations. Now, this was the back page of that first case notes, and I was really perplexed as to what this all meant. But this is the, the way rickettsiologists were recording their results. So this was the surname, or the second name, of the first patient, they became kidney, uh, guinea pig N1. Guinea pig N1 die, or was sacrificed or died, and they took organs from that, injected it into the next guinea pig, and that was guinea pig N4, because they'd already used N1 for somebody else. So the guinea pigs were all named like this, and carried them on. Now here was the experiment in, in a site's filter. Some were filtered, some weren't, and the ones that were filtered um, uh, did not get Q fever, but the ones that were... Uh, sorry, the ones that were filtered didn't get it. The ones that weren't filtered did. And then he showed that it went right on for 30 sub-inoculations. So clearly it was an infectious disease, or clearly it was an infection, although they couldn't recognise it, and clearly it was very doable. So I put all that in this sort of a way so that it makes more sense. And this was quite clear, once I read his article again, this was quite clear that this was what he did. So this is how it was done. Now this is case five was the J strain. J strain was very important too, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but when I was doing this, I wondered whether I could still find any of the patients, his original nine patients, whether any of them were still alive. So the youngest one was a chap called Joe Jamison, and he was treated by Dr. Ryan from the Valley. So I chased him. It took me about two years to find the said Joe Jamison. And yes, he was alive and well, very much so. And there he is. And he's very happy to have his name mentioned and to be shown and to be... In fact, we invited him to the first talk I gave on Q fever uh, some years ago in 2004. And so he was very pleased to be there. So I... So... I'll come back to him later because really he's very important indeed. And he's, as far as I know, he's still alive. Now this is his house 
uh, uh, in Light Street in the valley. His father was a boxing trainer and all of the boxers used to spend their off time working at the abattoirs. They just get in the ferry and go across to the abattoirs. And yes, a lot of them had Q fever. And I chased a lot of those up too. With, and that was quite interesting as well, but I haven't got time to talk about that. Now this was the first sample that was sent to Burnett, case five. And um, um, when Derek had got all of this material together, he wanted to publish it. But clearly, who was going to publish anything that came from somebody they'd never heard of from a place like Brisbane? And um, so, but that, that was, and Burnett was using, Burnett's records are there, and he was using, um, uh, he was using mice, and they grew the, the organism much better. Now, I think this there, is what a, um, a, a consultant would write to somebody asking him for an opinion. And I think he's writing back to Derek saying, I don't think it's a virus. I think it's a virus. I don't think it's spirochetes. I think it's rickettsii. Um, and that was really the time when they made the first investigation and then they wrote the paper in 1937. And there are copies of that outside if you'd like to read it. If you'd like to read it. Lots more, but we can't do it today. Thank you. Thank you. Robin, thanks very much. About uh, four months ago, I said to he Helen Healy, one of the great achievements in this hospital was the invention of the machine for renal dialysis and can you talk about it and Helen said no the expert is uh, Dr Professor Charles George from um, Concord in Sydney and uh, he's uh, agreed to come up and talk to us about the work of John uh, Charles Allen Dick. Uh, I remember him teaching me many of us here will have will have uh, worked with him but he certainly taught me and um, uh, Charles has come up to give us a talk on him. Charles is a renal physician at Concord. He's a deep interest in medical history and is current president of the Australian and New Zealand Society for the History of Medicine and is past president of the International Association of the History of Nephrology. Particular interest in renal failure, glomerular disease and in dialysis and history. So also I'd mention that many of um, uh, Dr. Dick's uh, family are here in the audience today. Charles, thanks very much for making the trip. Right. Yes, well, thank you very much for that, and ladies and gentlemen. It's a um, great pleasure to be able to come up here to Brisbane and speak a little bit about Dr. John Deke, who really was a remarkable person and whom I think uh, has received far too little uh, accolade um, in the past because of his, uh, for his contributions. Um, what I'm going to tell you is <clears throat> what I've been working on over the last couple of years, and I've been tremendously helped in this by um, uh, several of his uh, successors, his family, um, uh, Bet Green, Dr. Bet Green, who's in the audience, um, her brother, Nigel, and also Dr. Tony Deke, who um, is in practice also in Queensland. Um, having said that, I've got anything that I do say is what I have interpreted, and I don't know whether the family will totally agree with me with what I say, but I take responsibility for my own interpretations. So, Dr. John Deke, um, what do we know about him? Well, uh, he was born in 1915 in Burma, in Mandalay, and his father was a surgeon in the Indian Army. Um, his ancestry in India went back a long, long way. Um, I think the family was originally a French family who um, went to Madras, what's now Chennai, um, uh, via Pondicherry, somewhere around about the time of the French Revolution. Um, then they moved to Madras. Um, there were other ancestors who are partly Irish, um, an Irish sergeant major in the Madras regiment, um, and one or two um, of Indian ancestry. Um, his military career, um, uh, the military career of his father, his father was a, a decorated soldier in the First World War, served in, in the Indian Army in Mesopotamia. 
um, uh, John Deke's mother. Um, I, don't, I had great difficulty finding out much about her, but I think she had some German ancestry and a maternal aunt, I think, actually had gone to finishing school in Germany. So it suggests to you, here's a family that were a substantial family in uh, Anglo-India. Maternal un uncle served in the Indian Army in the First World War and again in the Second World War. A traditional um, Catholic Anglo-Indian family who very proudly considered themselves to be British. And John Deke, a man, he described himself that way, and um, <laughs> he'd never, he never set foot during his whole life in the United Kingdom, but he was very much, he considered himself, as I can interpret, a, a proud Englishman, British. Um, so, um, he had a, a, one sad thing that happened during his early life, when he was a teenager, and that was that his parents separated. And this um, led his mother uh, to have to live in a fairly impoverished sort of state, and that certainly reflected through onto him. He lived with his mother, um, and it, in a way, I think, helped form his character. Um, he um, went to... Um, uh, I got my slides out of order here. One moment. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I jumped over this. Um, he, he was sent, fortunately, though, to um, a, a, a very good uh, boarding school in the Himalayas, um, uh, up high in the Himalayas at Naini Tal. It was a Methodist Episcopal boarding school, and it had some very prominent old boys from about the time when he was there. Jim Corbett, a person who's gone down amongst the um, uh, green fraternity of the world as a, a person uh, very responsible for um, establishing uh, natural um, uh, sanctuaries for animals. Uh, the famous soldier, Ord Wingate. Um, the school was, was described as being more British than any school in Britain. Gave its children, uh, the boys who are at it, a classical education, led to the Cambridge Senior Exam. But they didn't just learn English. Uh, they also uh, learnt Hindi, and he, he could speak some Hindi, some Urdu, some Tamil. Very much a sporting background. He was very keen on sport. His brother was his best companion, and they, was also a great sportsman. Um, his father, for a time, was the resident surgeon in the Andaman Islands, which is where the um, Raj, the uh, British uh, administration of India, had its political prison. Um, and so he saw an interesting side of life there. Well, he went to the University of Madras, and he studied medicine. Um, he was very altruistic. Uh, his motivation for studying medicine was very altruistic. He really wanted to uh, help mankind. And he enjoyed the course there, even though he was, it was quite impoverished at the time because of the um, separation of his parents. But he graduated MBBS in 1941 at the age of 26. And he married uh, quite promptly then, Kitty Bartley, who was part Scottish ancestry. Um, and again, her family in India went back to the 17th century. Um, she was largely of European ancestry, a little bit of local Indian ancestry. Um, he joined the Indian Army Medical Corps, and he had postings in many parts around India. And I'll show you a map in a few moments uh, of the sorts of places he went to. But something that was very important for him was that the Indian Army during the Second World War, if, if for anyone who's interested in the history of blood transfusions, will know that um, blood transfusion was really just starting to come into its own. The Indian Army during the Second World War was tremendously advanced with its transfusion service. And he served in the Indian Army Transfusion Service. He was promoted to being a captain. Um, but then, of course, in 1947, India and Pakistan became independent. And there was a civil war, as everyone knows. There was massive death toll. Um, and that all culminated in the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. And as best I can interpret, he decided, uh, this is not the place for us as a family. Uh, there was a huge interracial strife between Hindus and Muslims. It's interesting, something I hadn't personally realised previously, was that the Anglo-Indians were really relatively unthreatened by the civil war that went on. They were put aside. There was this interracial, interreligious strife of Hindus to Muslims. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, 
So he decided to emigrate, along with his wife and his children and his mother. Um, and in fact, there was really an ethnic cleansing that was going on in India at that time of people like he. Um, they were sent to a place called the Homeward Bound Camp <laughs> to go back to Britain, the place that hmm, yeah, his ancestors might have left 200 years before. Um, but he decided uh, to come to Australia. They had distant relatives here in Australia. Um, and it was appalling uh, conditions that were living under at this uh, dear Laley homeward bound camp. Um, his mother caught typhoid. He tried to look after her, but she died. And then to add to their difficulties, they struck the white Australia policy. Um, and this is really very interesting. Um, we all know about how uh, the uh, people in Germany during the Second World War, or during the Nazi era, um, had to go back four or five generations to make sure that they had no Jewish ancestry. Well, Australia, uh, at that time, when people were emigrating, uh, from places like India to Australia, had to produce similar written uh, documentation to show they had no local ancestry, or at least if they did, that it was only minuscule, less than about a quarter. Something that doesn't seem to be given much prominence in Australian history when we talk about it. Anyhow, they got on board the PNO's SS Stratheden, which was a very upmarket ship at that time, and what a change from the um, circumstances they'd been living in in this uh, homeward bound DLALI um, camp for uh, people from the Indian Army who were being got rid of from India. Um, but just to finish off showing you his career in India, um, there's a picture of him at the um, transfusion service in Pune, 1947. I think he's the in the front row, the second from the right. Uh, and to give you a little bit of an idea of where he travelled around India and, and what became Pakistan um, and, of course, Burma, um, to show you the breadth of, of background that he had into the racial uh, uh, society of the subcontinent. You can see it started in Mandalay, went to Madras, went up to Naini Tal to school, down for holidays in the Andaman Islands, um, back up to school in Naini Tal in the Himalayas, back to Madras, uh, studied at the university, um, w then went to places for honeymoon to Bangalore, then up to Royal Pindi, right up in the um, uh, the other end of the Himalayas, and you can see moving around and around uh, over towards Calcutta, and then in, uh, to Pune, and finally finally ending up near Bombay at this place, dear Laley, onto the ship and to Australia. Well, you'd think that uh, this was uh, the making of life for him, but ha -ha, life was not all that easy as, as the ship arrived in Australia. Um, he'd not been allowed to bring much money at all out of India. They had a, a, a prohibition on the removal of currency. Um, and so he, he and his uh, children and, um, uh, and wife had very, very little money. The ship stopped in Fremantle. So he went ashore. Um, it was there for 24 hours uh, or so. Um, he went up to Royal Perth Hospital, asked if there were any jobs for doctors. Sorry, sir, no jobs. Ship went on to Adelaide, Royal Adelaide Hospital. Any jobs for doctors? Sorry, sir, no jobs. Ship went on to Melbourne, Royal Melbourne Hospital. Any jobs for doctors? Sorry, sir, no jobs. On to Sydney, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Sorry, sir, no jobs. Uh, by this time, the ship had come to the end of the voyage, so he got on the train, left his family in Sydney or in Gosford and um, with these distant relatives, and um, came up to Brisbane. Ha ha, came to Brisbane General Hospital. Any jobs? Yes, sir. We've got a job for you. You can do blood transfusions. We need a transfusionist and a resuscitationist. And so, thank heavens, he got a job here. Um, and it just shows what Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney missed out on. Um, well, he 
immediately started uh, an, an, a career. Um, he developed, worked on a, an intravenous transfusion set that he'd already been working on when he was in India. Um, and he then modified that and uh, invented a, a new one, um, which was apparently widely used in the Queensland and Papua New Guinea hospitals. Um, he went on to pioneer, as best I can understand, neonatal exchange transfusion here in Brisbane. Um, he had a, a, a great uh, skill at putting in intravenous needles, and he was able to uh, get uh, intravenous transfusions running on the neonatal infants. Um, he, he wrote that up. Uh, it was widely, it was published in the mm, journal, it's changed its name now, but Journal of um, Obstetrics and Gynecology of the British Empire, whatever it used to be called. Um, uh, he actually wrote an MD thesis, which he submitted to the University of Queensland. And I've read his thesis. I've got to say, it's a very, very impressive thesis. Sadly, however, and I don't understand why, the uh, University of Queensland did not see fit to give him an MD. And I think that's really very sad because it is an impressive thesis. Anyhow, um, he moved sideways a little bit then, and I think uh, because of uh, some association with the man who was running the blood transfusion service at the Red Cross here at the time, um, uh, they became interested in dialysis because blood transfusions uh, were necessary in order to, um, uh, when, when dialysis was first being started. And so he, he built two separate dialysis machines. The first one in 1954. Um, now, I haven't gone into a lot of detail here for you, because I don't want to bore you with the fine details of the invention of dialysis, but Wilhelm Kolff in Holland, uh, whilst it was occupied the, by the German army in 1942, was the first person to build and successfully use a hemodialysis machine on a human being. There had been attempts on animals earlier. Um, but Kolff successfully dialysed some patients, um, about the first 14 of them died, uh, but then he managed to get one or two or three uh, who survived. Um, and uh, Kolff's design of a machine was published, um, and Deke uh, had a, a, uh, the details of that. Um, there was a book that Kolff actually published uh, in London uh, in about 1947 or 48, which had all the details. Um, and from the diagrams in that book, Deke appears to have built this machine. Uh, he treated, uh, with the assistance of Dr. Doris Wrench, um, uh, 11 patients and got a close on 50% survival. These people all had acute renal failure. Uh, the only way that they could cannulate the patients in order to get blood out to put through the hemodialysis machine was putting glass cannulae into the femoral vein um, and having a return in the arm or elsewhere. Um, it was only possible to do two or at most three dialyses on an, any given patient before they so macerated the tissue that it couldn't be used anymore. Um, that machine was very difficult to use. Um, in building it, he had the assistance of an electrician here at Brisbane Hospital, Mr. Harold Lloyd. And I have not been able to find out any details about Lloyd, but Lloyd is mentioned in the acknowledgements of the published uh, work on this. If, if there's anybody who knows anything about Harold Lloyd, I'd be really grateful if you could uh, let me know, because I think it is really important that the person with the technical ability uh, should also get uh, credit. I've um, had been uh, in contact with people, not just from the um, personnel department here of this hospital, but also of the Queensland Health Department and Queensland archi Government Archives, um, and nobody seems to be able to tell me anything about uh, Brisbane Hospital's electrician, Mr. Harold Lloyd. I found a little bit about Dr. Doris Wrench, who was the um, resident doctor who assisted. Um, anyhow, that machine was difficult to use, and so there was a Swede named Allwall who had developed a different type of uh, dialysis machine. Um, and so uh, Lloyd and Deke went ahead and built an Allwall type machine, and they dialysed, dialysed another 10 or 11 patients, and again got about 50% survival for people with acute renal failure. 
This is about as good survival as we get these days for people with severe acute renal failure. So they weren't doing too badly. And these were very, very primitive machines, but they were built by people who had never actually themselves set eyes on a dialysis machine that anybody else had made in the world. Um, there were only, probably in the world when they first started in 1954, there were probably only about 15 hospitals anywhere in the world that were doing hemodialysis. So this was very early in the world history of dialysis. Um, well, there is their survival. Overall, 9 out of 20 patients survived. In 1956, because there had been quite a lot of uh, biochemistry involved in, in, in monitoring these patients, he was very interested in biochemistry. In 1956, he became a foundation member of the College of Pathologists. And just inter alia, I've got to tell you that in his published uh, articles on this, um, there are the blood urea levels, which are quoted, but it does not give what the normal range in this hospital was for blood urea at that time. And again, I have had... Im I have found it impossible to find out what this hospital's normal range was for laboratory blood urea levels uh, in the 1950s. I have been in communication with people from the pathology department. Um, they've done weeks and weeks and weeks of searching, I understand, but nobody can tell me what was the normal range. Um, anyhow, there's little doubt of my assessment that these patients were very uremic. Um, okay, but then a really sad thing happened. Uh, John Deak and his wife had had a further son and in 1957 this three-year-old died of apparently renal failure. He developed nephritis. Now I suspect that this probably had a profound effect on the father. He left the hospital sort of shortly after that uh, and he set up a private pathology practice in Wickham Terrace um, and uh, with the rooms also adjacent to the Mata Hospital. Um, he did quite a lot of work also at the Mata Hospital as a transfusionist and resuscitationist and helping with uh, neonatal uh, exchange transfusions. And he continued conducting his private practice through till 1979. Now, just to show you the dialysis machines, he, he published all the details of this. It was in the Medical Journal of Australia, very carefully written articles um, with full details of, of each patient, so there's no doubt about the uh, accuracy of the claims of, su of survival. That was the colf type dialysis machine. You can see it's quite a complex thing. It's a rotating drum of, of uh, wood, wooden drum uh, with a... Um, coil wound around it of cellophane, blood ran, da ran down through the central uh, core of the cellophane coil and the drum rotated around through a bathtub of dialyzing fluid with a motor driving it. And there's a picture of the machine in action published in the Medical Journal of Australia in 1955, a very detailed article picture of Deke, probably sort of just a little bit earlier, I suspect. Maybe he was, uh, that's in a military uniform, so it may have been taken just before he left India. But that was when an obituary of, was published of him. Okay. He was in private practice as a pathologist, uh, but he started to develop a great interest in social issues and political issues. And this seemed to be triggered in 1956, because at that time, southern Rhodesia um, was uh, um, the winds of change that uh, Harold Macmillan had said were blowing through Africa were starting to blow on southern Rhodesia, and Australia imposed some trade sanctions. He strongly opposed that. He felt that Australia should not be uh, taking part in sacrificing what he perceived as a civilised and achieving group of people within a multiracial society to what he considered to be an egalitarian political ideology. And he went on to develop over the next um, uh, 15 years or so a, a fairly coherent political creed based upon that. Um, he had a view of Australia. Here's a man who came from India, from the subcontinent. He had a view of Australia as not being part of Asia. He objected 
to the claim that Australia is part of Asia. Um, he, he drew attention uh, to the line drawn across uh, what's now Indonesia, uh, separating Oceania from Asia. Uh, separating not just geographically, but in terms of flora, in terms of fauna, in terms of uh, the ethnicity of the people. Um, and so he considered that we are living in a separate continent uh, that's not part of Asia. Then he was uh, very proudly for God, for king, for country. He is a man who believed in low taxation, in personal independence, very strongly in polite conduct to everybody. He supported Aborigines. He's a, strongly, a strong supporter of home life and of people having large families if they could. He opposed communism, he opposed socialism, he also opposed um, uh, undisciplined capitalism. He looked upon, as best I can determine from what he published, all three of those as being failed philosophies, failed political philosophies. He opposed contraception. He certainly opposed indiscriminate immigration and he opposed multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. So he became a social pariah. <laughs> now, he didn't help himself because he was ever more associated with what we would, might describe as right-wing groups. Um, held various meetings around in Brisbane, um, um, published bulletins. Uh, these largely these supported the viewpoints I've just mentioned in the last slide, and they opposed indiscriminate immigration. And then the Bulletin magazine um, published a whole issue that featured him and about uh, seven or eight other people uh, whom they said had similar views. Unfortunately, it was very sad for him that he was included in this group of people because some of them are what we'd now call bikey types. No, not, not the sort of people that I suspect he was, but the authoress of this uh, article in the Bulletin magazine that went on for page after page after page and had many sort of uh, inflammatory photographs um, uh, sort of lumped him in with the rest. However, she got a good quote from him. I am a racist. Everybody is a racist. Everybody likes the company of people of his own kind. And to me, I think this is a really important thing. We, nowadays, seem to have come to use the term racist with a particular derogatory connotation. But it is a term that can be used with multiple different connotations. And it's wise that people recognise that. Because he used the word racist not in a derogatory sense at all, as best I can understand from reading his articles. Racism to him meant homogenising society and enjoying in a mixed society the company of people like oneself. So it didn't necessarily mean adverse discrimination against people who are not like oneself. So he liked the company of people like him, who happened to be of similar ethnic background to him. And I just throw this in, although I didn't, it's not in anything that he wrote. Um, as I got off the plane this afternoon uh, at Brisbane Airport, uh, I noticed a group of, I suspect, the students, hmm, they look to me as though they're all Chinese. And they're all together. <laughs> And then I came along a little bit further through Brisbane Airport and I saw four or five people, Sikhs, with Sikh headdresses on. <laughs> they were all together. And this is what John Deke was saying. People of, uh, who, who have things in common with each other like to be in the company of people like each other. And to him, because they're usually of the same race, this is racism. But his experience in India also uh, demonstrated um, that, that there can be many difficult problems created by the interaction of races. 
I really want to emphasize this. His experience indicated that the word can have many interpretations, but that mere mention of it is enough to destroy a person's reputation. Now, I mentioned that he published various booklets. Here's one of them, Immigration, the Quiet Invasion. And you can see the arrow coming down from Asia into Australia. <laughs> Pretty inflammatory. And there's the Bulletin Magazine. Who are the racists? And here are a picture of, um, not him, but these are the bikey types. Well, that's one aspect. On the other aspect, what is this gentleman like? Well, he was a devout Catholic. He'd, interest, he'd read the whole Bible, interestingly, the King James Version. Now, I suppose that's because he went to a, uh, an Episcopalian American type, American Episcopalian Methodist school. Uh, he liked the King James Bible and he'd read it more than three times. He loved the Beatitudes and now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And he was very charitable to people, and to people of all races, um, as I understand, in his um, uh, pathology practice. And he would often not charge people regardless of their race. He was strongly supportive of Aboriginal people. Um, he was personally very frugal, but he was financially generous to others. Then in January 1995, he'd been unwell for some years, and he eventually died of cardiac disease, of respiratory disease. It's interesting that he had had some, uh, he'd kept an aviary of birds, and one wonders whether that might have uh, been important there, and of terminal renal failure. But when asked, he declined to have dialysis. He was a frugal man. He was careful with money. He didn't like waste. He said it would unnecessarily waste money. So what did he leave behind? Well, he left a wife. He strongly believed in big families. So he had more than 40 children, some here in the audience tonight, grandchildren, some here, great-grandchildren. I would suggest to you that he had a history of brilliant scientific achievement. He's the sort of person that we really ought to be very, very proud of. He managed to get himself a reputation as an unredeemed racist, but he had political insights that possibly are way ahead of his time for Australia into the view that multicultural policies can destabilise society. They can breed civil strife. They can embitter individuals. They can risk future civil war. He saw that in India. And they can even stimulate terrorist activities. And I'll just throw in with this. Last night, as I was watching television and uh, seeing what was going on in the uh, political developments of Australia in the last 24 hours, um, I uh, heard the ABC commentator say, oh, Malcolm Turnbull might not be such a threat to multiracial Australia. <laughs> And I, then I compared that um, with what I read when I was, I was at a conference in London um, about two months ago, two or three months ago, um, and in the British newspapers um, there was a series of articles two or three months ago saying multiracial Britain demonstrates how multiracialism has collapsed as an ideolo as a political ideology and the, and the Western world needs a different viewpoint. I thought, that's what Dr John Deke was saying in Brisbane <laughs> back in the 1970s and 80s. Well, what did he do? He left a reputation amongst his family and his friends as a fine Anglo-Indian. He described himself as a Briton, as a great Briton. But he was a devoted Australian and he was a very kind man. Charles, thanks very much. It's a brilliant uh, paper on obviously a complex but a great man. Uh, any questions to Charles? We've just got a minute. Um, and we do have to do some awards, I think. And Ian, I think you're going to just finish up. Charles, thanks very much. Peace. Thank you, Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to all of the speakers. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, evening. Um, 
I remember Dr. Deke having uh, letters to the editor published in the Courier Mail on a very regular basis. So uh, he must have, uh, his ideas must have had some resonance with the editor over over many many years. So it was very widely published in the in the popular press. Uh, all of the people we've heard about tonight have uh, led uh, fascinating lives, and uh, I, I'm very grateful to all of the speakers tonight for. Uh, for presenting their uh, their very interesting stories, um, there are some uh, gifts to the speakers, but maybe we should just do that uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, you've all been very patient, and there's some refreshments waiting outside. Um, I should uh, again thank our sponsors, Q Super and the Queensland Police Credit Union, for helping to make this uh, all possible. Um, some of you may know that there is a, a fairly long-standing uh, exhibition on, on uh, the uh, commemorating the centenary of Gallipoli, the Anzac uh, exhibition and the contribution of uh, the hospital staff, which is in the, the foyer of the main hospital. And also the uh, nursing museum is open tonight uh, for those of you who'd like to just cross the, the uh, uh, the uh, driveway. It's the building immediately opposite the entrance to this building. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, again Jim Myers, Jeanette Wiley, Robin Cook, Charles George, and particularly Cliff Pollard for his uh, MC. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we, we've got uh, more than 600 members of the Royal Alumni, but uh, we would like uh, thousands. So please uh, let people know that we exist and encourage your friends uh, and colleagues to uh, become members. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite you to join us for some refreshments outside and thank you all for coming. <laughs>